Greetings, music lovers. Welcome to another episode of The Raga Room with Deepa Joshi. Have you wondered about art and attunement? With attunement, we enter into a responsive relationship to experience an affinity to art that is not conscious. Art cannot act by itself. It needs allies, helpers, and supporters. Attunement is a collective achievement. Our guest today, the dynamic, versatile duo, Bindu and Ambi Subramanyam, through their numerous initiatives and eclectic music, have taken on the cultural responsibility to initiate, educate, and connect people to music. And it is my absolute pleasure to be talking to them at the Raga Room. Hailed as the new king of Indian classical violin and named among GQ magazine's 25 most influential Indians, Ambi Subramanyam is trained by his father and guru, Dr. L. Subramanyam, from the age of three and gave his first performance at the age of seven. Along with his sister, Bindu Subramanyam, Ambi runs Sapa, Subramanyam Academy of Performing Arts, which is creating and nurturing the next generations of musicians. In 2014, he co-founded the Sapa in Schools program with Bindu, which helps students develop 21st century skills and a growth mindset using music as a gateway. The program impacts over 30,000 students across India every year. He has received awards and recognitions including the Ritz Icon of the Year Award, the Rotary Youth Award, two Global Indian Music Awards and received a Golden Violin from Sri Jayendra Saraswati when he was only 18. Ambi co-hosts the Sapa show on Shankara TV to teach global music to the young children across the world. He is also a youth delegate at the United Nations for the Sri Chinmaya Peace Meditation Group. Ambi plays a part of contemporary world music band Subramania, which he formed along with Bindu. He also plays as part of the Tair Sadam project, which he formed along with Bindu, Carnatic fusion artist Mahesh Raghavan and percussionist Akshay Anantapadmanabhan. He has toured extensively across Europe, Asia and the United States. Ambi has a bachelor's degree in business management and an MBA and a PhD. Bindu Subramanyam Singer, songwriter, co-founder and CEO of Sapa. She co-founded the Sapa in School program with her brother Ambi Subramanyam in 2014. Bindu strongly believes that music is more than a feel-good element. It's a transformational tool that should be made available to every child. At Sapa in Schools, music education is the primary channel of bringing about large-scale transformation and has impacted over 100,000 children across India. Bindu is building an ecosystem for music education from the ground up, a first-of-its-kind innovation for the Indian market. This involves designing the curriculum, setting the syllabus, authoring all learning material, training and empowering educators, and also convincing stakeholders of the need. She also works with 16-plus government schools and has provided music education to over 16,000 children free of cost. The impact has been profound. School principals reported a noticeable spike in school attendance on days when children had SAPA classes. In 2020, SAPA took its entire curriculum online, hosting self-paced courses by some of the world's best musicians, like Dr. L. Subramanyam, Kavita Krishnamurti Subramanyam, Anup Chalota, Russ Miller, and more. SAPA in Schools has partnered with the Norwegian Academy of Music, UNICEF, the Akshay Patra Foundation, the International Society for Music Education, Foundation Royamon, Book a Smile and the Infosys Foundation. Bindu was one of India's first educators to develop a toddler-focused musical training module and has co-authored 15 SAPA textbooks. She was listed as GQ's 2021 list of 25 most influential young Indians and was named among business worlds. 40 under 40. She is a part of the Stanford C Transformation Program cohort of 2020. She has a master's degree in law from London University, a master's certificate in songwriting and music business from Berklee College of Music, a Montessori diploma, an MPhil, a PhD in music education. What a delight it is to invite the most talented Subramanian duo to the Raga Room. Oh, mm-hmm.
ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನಾದವು ಹರಿನಾದವೇ ಶಿವೇ Bindu hi Ambi thank you so very much for coming to the Raga room and it is my absolute pleasure to be talking to you today thank you for having us so it's a real pleasure to be here and to have this conversation with you yeah thanks so much for having us sure um when i see you both on screen what comes alive is your energy and how easy it is to connect for the for the audience to connect with you both Uh, having said that you know you believe in the philosophy of a confluence of old world charm and contemporary appeal really being the way to take music to audience locally and globally uh, what has brought on that ideology and how have you been able to strike that chord and be the old world charm was uh, aimed at you because of your mustache so go ahead <laughs> <laughs> well i i think to be very honest when when we started playing music uh, we didn't really think of any of those things uh, we just kind of um, at least personally i was lucky to have been exposed to so many amazing styles of music so uh, it was more of trying to kind of uh, uh, learn the different types of music learn from different people that uh, that you really uh, admire and uh, try to Uh, understand different types of music and then so i think because of that some some may have been uh, um more traditional styles of music some may have been more contemporary styles of music and i think that's kind of happened very organically so um i, I don't think there was a concerted effort to kind of really uh, take something traditional and something contemporary but it's kind of taking um all the things that uh, that we're interested in and trying to make sense of that absolutely right and like you correctly said to that was something that i was going to get at a good segue at when you have so much music born into a music family and when you are meeting with the creme de la creme of musicians and there's so much music going on like you said different genres and it's a very um, immersive experiences the thought processes also that come into your head there are so many and um one thing that i would like to know from you is that when there is that much like you know when we are presented with just like for a new person without having any kind of a background you go to your school and you learn your basic sargams and then you go on progressively there is a stream but then you are in an environment where you're surrounded by all kinds of music and you have a barrage of thoughts and music going on and how do you process streamline and come up with different projects so i think one thing that that uh is that it was very normal for us so we don't know what would have been a different way to learn music or how other people engage with music but this this idea of an immersive musical experience and and meeting great artists and and sort of spending time with them and absorbing how people interact with their art was just a very normal experience for us so that kind of set the tone for us that all different kinds of music exist in the world and whatever it is you choose to pursue you're looking at the highest level of art so when we approach it like that uh it it kind of gave us this very organic sense of of um an individualistic music right where all these different kinds of pieces can come together in their own way and i think for us also i mean like you're saying there was um there are so many different styles that we were exposed to so many people we met but i i think um it was kind of our parents and especially my dad i think a, a lot who who kind of helped us make sense of all of that so um i remember when when we were learning different things as well we were learning 
say western classical violin carnatic violin piano singing all of these different things uh he was also kind of there to make sure that they all made sense together that does definitely make sense and like you say you know apple doesn't fall too far off from the tree um again uh, when we look at you both that's there's such an all roundedness uh, not only are you musicians you have so many accomplishments to your credit you're both very highly qualified educated and you are the you delegates for the un your composers your educators you're constantly innovating um how, i mean again this is a cliche question how does it all take shape and how is it that you're able to bring your music to people with through all of your initiatives i mean um what is your objective when you're thinking and conceptualizing a project well i think at least for me a uh, a good reason to get out of the bed in the morning is just to kind of increase the level of access that people have to music and one big way in which that manifests is on the music that we do there and when we look at accessibility it's one affordability but two also making music more approachable and something that people can relate to better so uh i think across the board really uh the way that all of these things come together whether it's our education or the work that we do or the way that we perform or the music that we create it's all about just making music that resonates with us and that we can share with everybody out there and i think uh it's it's a great thing that we don't have to sit and worry about what box each of these things fit into like am i yeah. am i being yeah. am i being a creator now am i being a researcher now or you know so uh and i think that's just the way that the world is now right i mean so many of us are more than one thing we're not just identified by a single byline and these different interests and passions and skills that we have tend to merge together in in the most interesting ways right and how beautiful it is when everything comes together and uh, also when you you have a uh, ways to explore all of these avenues there are means to explore it discover it and get into it and research it and through your initiatives you've also been able to provide that platform to several people and one of those signature initiatives that you have co-founded is the sapa foundation uh which is integrated with the state board the curriculum is what i understand so would you like to talk about it please beautiful ambi so i think she was referring okay, to go ahead <laughs> through sapa the idea was to make music a meaningful part of every child's life and we look at that in two different ways through our academy which functions online and through our physical centers we're sort of working towards creating the next generation of musicians so we have students that come in as young as a year and a half and then they stay with us all the way into adulthood we also have adults who are with us and international visiting musicians who want to learn um, specific things relating to indian or global music and so we have our own syllabus yeah. curriculum and a lot on very music so very strong focus on indian and indian classical music western contemporary and classical music but also how these different skill sets can come together and what is the place of say uh, an african chora when collaborating with an indian classical musician so at sapa we're we're kind of this home for for music and it's really great to see how our students and and the music grow together and uh, how things develop on the other side where we're looking at um you know holistic education and development we look at making music a meaningful part of school education and we work with about 30,000 children now where uh we partner with schools to provide music curriculum teacher training um lesson plans workshops with musicians assessments books music and we think that when we look at music global music classical music interdisciplinarity social emotional learning just having access to high quality music can make the life of a young child so much better very true and it, it's quite calming and i have seen i have a, a 17 year old and uh, i have seen constantly that he will have his headphones on there will be music playing and he'll be doing math and i'm 
uh, wondering how that happens but he says i can never focus if i'm not listening to music and somehow it's very calming it's very grounding and i think music is a place to go to it's like a getaway in your head when you're in several situations be it has happy sad or uh, reflective that is amazing so you did say that uh, you founded uh, sapa in 2014 and a lot of things are now accessible online along with that also comes with the challenge of how you keep the focus or concentration of children because there is so much available today and uh, Uh, for anybody unless you are really very grounded and you know how to process when you go on youtube your ai is going to bring you a number of things that is available and uh, how do you keep uh, the focus for children and how the online training the the pros and cons of it how do you deal with it uh, so there are a number of things i think uh, also that the pandemic kind of taught us uh, because we weren't really a uh, two focused in the online space uh, pre pandemic uh, but i think the first thing we kind of realized uh, was that uh, you can't kind of try to replace the physical experience with an online experience uh, those are two very separate things and i think um, to that point whether whether it was teaching or performance um, those uh, online experiences and and physical experiences are are very very different so i think when we were looking at um uh online classes and all of that we also had the opportunity to use a lot of technology to kind of aid uh things so we so for example we built a platform um a learning management system so where we used uh things like the tanpura metronomes and added uh, different widgets as well so uh kids could kind of uh, use that uh, as well um in an online uh, scenario we were able to build kind of these uh, uh kind of gamification of some concepts so they were able to learn say musical the- theory and and other uh, things in a kind of fun way so i think um those things have been really useful so now um and of course i mean everyone knows that uh online means accessibility is there from which, whichever part of the world uh, all of those things have, of course uh, are are big things uh, so i think but uh, when we kind of had opportunity to come back offline uh, we were able to kind of use like a hybrid blended model where we were able to kind of uh, hopefully bring the best of both and uh, ultimately the the kind of student uh, they uh, benefit the most it must be such a gratifying experience too to educate several kids and to make a difference in so many children's life uh would you like to share some of those experiences where uh you know you felt like this is what we did and this is why we did it it's it's incredibly gratifying and i think uh if ambe and i get started on stories of kids uh it's it's something that just could go on for hours and days and uh it's a really powerful thing i mean um we've seen time and time again in different settings how children respond to music and how as they grow into you know young adults how music continues to be a meaningful part of their lives uh off the top of my head i want to give you uh, an example that happened with my daughter when she was quite young um we have included african music and a song in swahili uh in our level 2 book uh because we think that it's really important for children in schools to understand global music firstly but also we wanted to present african culture and african music because i think that there is uh, a propensity to sort of misunderstand and and marginalize those kind of things and um it's been extremely popular you know these swahili songs and uh generally like the rhythms and all of the cool things and so we were on a plane coming back from london to bangalore and um the uh announcements were going on before the plane was taking off and they were saying that okay uh the in flight attendants on this flight speak english arabic swahili and my daughter just got so excited and she was so small at that point she just got so excited with this idea that somebody spoke swahili because it was a sort of magical language to her and she had never really encountered anybody who spoke it and 
the moment uh, the seatbelt sign was switched off, she sort of jumped up and ran to the back of the plane and I had to follow her. Um, and she's just asking everybody in uniform, do you speak Swahili? Do you speak Swahili? And um, the first lady was like, no, why? And then another lady's like, yes, but why do you ask? And she just looked up at her with so much love and adoration in her eyes and started singing, Jambo, Jambo, Guana. And that lady just melted. And it became this, this immediate connection where she's like, I don't know, you know, really who you are or where you're from or, or why a small child from Bangalore is singing uh, Swahili songs. But this is a very powerful thing. And, and I'd like to share another song from my childhood. And so she sort of wrote out, uh, she made a card for my daughter with lyrics of another Swahili song. So that was, to me, just such a pertinent example of how music can just cross all sorts of barriers and then create immediate human connections. Absolutely. And those are the best connections, right? When things happen impromptu like that. And I think there is some kind of, um, some kind of intrigue when you introduce a new language to a child because they do not understand, but it sounds really very interesting to learn and uh, that will give them such a perfect uh, you know avenue to explore and learn that is uh, that is a wonderful thing um, i was also very uh, intrigued about the work that you do with un uh, did you want to talk about um, the projects that you do with them how how, how that has been uh, working oh sure uh, so uh, for me i i feel very lucky to have been teaching uh, for the last I don't know how many ever years. Uh, if I tell you actually how long I've been teaching, you'll realize how old I am. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it, it's been a lot of it's been a lot of fun actually uh, to kind of see. Uh, personally, I've I've taught uh, um, kids who are like uh, five, six, seven, who are now uh, kind of going into college and and things like that. So it's it's really uh, very satisfying to see that kind of journey and. And uh, what's really nice is to kind of see them uh, kind of chart out their own path. So um, initially, you kind of see when when you're teaching, they're trying to kind of imitate you and trying to get the right thing and play the right way with the right bowing and the right uh, phrasing and all of that. And then uh, over a period of time, you know, you, you kind of see that, that point where um, they kind of feel comfortable to start doing their own things and um, and that that is very special where they kind of uh, are, are sitting next to you and like okay but you do it this way but can I try doing it this way and I think as, as a teacher that's that's just uh, the best feeling when they kind of uh, one feel comfortable enough to tell you that they want to do something a different way and uh, to kind of see that they are able to kind of bring their own voice into into what they're doing. Um, sometimes I'll I'll be sitting with one of my students, and uh, and then suddenly I'll see a video of them uh, playing a different instrument. That uh, then I, I message them and say, "When did you learn?" Like, no, no, I just I just picked this up because I wanted to learn this. Uh, so it, it's it's really nice when you when you see that, and ultimately uh, when you kind of um, you reach a point where uh, you're making music with them and uh, uh, you also learn so much in the process when you teach different students how you kind of uh, uh, how you approach things very differently so uh, I've also learned uh, so much when trying to teach these different students um, okay maybe maybe this method will work for this uh, this student or you kind of realize uh, w something that you were teaching may be not at all be relevant for, for another student. So I, I think that that journey has been really special. And when you see uh, all these kids putting in so much effort, that's very, very uh, satisfying as a teacher. Especially when they personalize it, they've already made it their own. So yeah, yeah. That's so true. Um, Again, uh, getting into now, you were talking about how it has, how teaching has also helped you in your learning as well, right? So getting into your music itself, 
there are so many genres of music that you have learned and play and incorporate in your music as we talked about in the beginning of uh, this conversation so uh, any particular styles that you resonate with more than the other and how the symbiosis happens between both of your music when you get together to uh, create a project so i i think uh, i wouldn't say there's one particular genre that i like more than the other uh, of course i mean i started learning carnatic music as a child and for me that will always be my reference point for everything else um so whether i'm trying to learn say some a beethoven sonata on the piano or trying to pick up uh, a jazz piece or or, or whatever that reference point uh, i would say my mother tongue is is carnatic music yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but but having said that um uh, if i'm trying to learn something else if i'm trying to pick up other things then um automatically i mean i i wouldn't do that unless i really uh, uh, kind of i uh, love that style of music so uh, and i think it's really nice to kind of uh, uh, be in um a kind of profession where you don't really have to choose and uh, and i i've loved the fact uh, when we performed that one day i'm doing a pure carnatic concert the next day i'm doing uh, a kind of a bollywood concert with my mom or the third day uh, you know i'm playing with an orchestra so um, and that uh, i love that kind of challenge of trying to do each one authentic to its kind of uh, uh, structure so um yeah i i would say that i i'm really grateful that i don't have to choose and uh, and they all kind of help each other so you you learn so much um that can be adapted to other uh settings when you're doing music yeah and i think sorry sorry no i was just going to say if you had something to add to that and i i was going to say what i what i think is also really nice is that um when we were kids we learned a number of different styles of music and so there was a lot of exposure to different things and we naturally gravitated uh to similar and to different things and so for me i was very excited with uh you know say western and pop music and and when we started collaborating together as supermania in 2013 we we were essentially starting from different spaces uh and what was really fun was how we could bring those spaces together and create this kind of new musical language or this new musical space where there was no judgment and just a lot of fun around interacting with different musical styles and so how does that translate when you're performing uh in a band with your brother or how does it work when we're doing something like Taishan project where we have Carnatic and Electronica and then again when you're performing in a family context or you're performing with an orchestra it's all just different setups and then you have this place of your own honest authentic music and then you go out and you meet so many different styles and so many different artists so every time you are possibly creating something new and fresh and exciting such a wonderful place to be in. i just want to be a fly on the wall when it happens just just stay somewhere and just quiet <laughs> just watch and enjoy <laughs> um i always i'm interested in finding out like among so many i'm sure there are like multiple hundreds of experiences that you have had something that has made a difference in your life that was there was just that one chord like a performance or a concert or uh, an interaction with somebody that was very instrumental in you taking your craft forward i think there are so many i'm going to uh give you one and then give it back to ambi because i know he's had many as well uh i had the opportunity to perform with my dad and the legendary jazz vocalist aljero uh jazz and pop and and it was just such a powerful experience to see how this man lived and interacted with music and i remember that i was fairly young and just so overwhelmed with how he was and and i was just kind of absorbing you know absorbing throughout those few days that we were with him and i was pretty moved and i just went and i touched his feet and he's like so what are you doing and i'm like well in my culture this is how we show respect and i'm showing that i respect you 
And he turned around and he touched my feet back. And I was so horrified, right? And he's like, well, I respect you too. And so it was just really cool to see how different people are immersed in music, how different people interact. And, and this sort of behind the scenes look at artists has been something that's really powerful because what you see on stage is just one angle of it. Yeah, I, I think uh, for me as well, I've I've had uh, the tremendous good fortune to meet some incredible musicians, and and um, I've always kind of uh, enjoyed knowing them as people and trying to figure out what makes them tick. I think uh, the first time uh, I met uh, Ernie Watts, who is this incredible um, jazz saxophone player, uh, so. And heard so much about him and uh, he played a lot with my dad as well so uh, growing up all of these cds with him playing we've kind of heard uh, uh, a lot so the first time we kind of performed together and i got a chance to meet him and and all of that um, i think it was it was in bombay and we were we kind of met uh, straight at soundcheck so we were all quite quite tired we just come from different places and finish the sound check and um, I think it was about 3 3 30 so then we were all staying right next to, right next to the venue so we we're like okay fine we'll all go uh, rest a little bit get ready and then come back and he had just come from the US so then um, I go to his room and kind of knock and say would you like to come back with us we'll have some lunch somewhere then he was like, no, 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 I just got here. Uh, I need to practice before the concert. And he was like 60 plus at that point. Uh, he's like, I need to practice. And then I see he has a, a, a bowl of peanuts uh, with him. He's like, no, 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 you, you, you guys go ahead. I, I'll sit and practice my scales. And from so from 3.30 to 7, he was just practicing scales so he would be ready for the concert. This was him at already, uh, he had been um, the kind of at the peak of his career for decades already. And uh, those kind of things really stick with you when you see how much effort uh, that is put behind the scenes. And uh, um, I, I kind of, when, when you see uh, what they kind of have to do uh, behind the scenes that nobody really knows. I mean, sure, you know that, okay, fine, they must have practiced a lot, they must have done all of these things, but then when you when you see it, I remember another uh, musician, uh, a tuba player um, that we are uh, good friends with, he is the only tuba soloist in the world, so he's from Norway, so when we met him, uh, again, he was kind of, um, uh, he was there with our festival, and uh, one evening we were all sitting together, and we were just talking, and um, then he started saying uh, things about his childhood and and uh, at one point he decided that he wanted to become a soloist and he didn't want to uh, play the back of the orchestra and so he said I decided that I will do what it takes so he said um, I wanted to make sure that I could sustain myself so uh, he said for like a decade all that he ate was this potato leek soup for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and he said all of my friends were going uh, going to work, doing nine to five jobs, all of that. So I decided that I will do the same. So if he would practice from nine in the morning to five in the evening, and and have only that potato leek soup because it was the cheapest thing available. And he said I will make it as a tuba soloist, and I will do what it takes. And I was just completely blown away because again. Um, I, I I had met him once uh, he had already become this huge superstar and, and all of these cool things that he did so when when you kind of see uh, different artists and what what they've kind of uh, gone through um, to really get better at their craft it, it's very inspiring Wow uh, just to tie together you know Bindu and Abhi uh, when Bindu was talking about how, uh, you know, you went and touched uh, the musician's feet and uh, 
feelings have such a wonderful way to manifest respect has such a wonderful way to manifest when even the audience are enjoying a wonderful performance and when they connect on that one high note and you're like okay this is it this is my moment like i have seen my god that's what it is and uh, when ambi was talking about we never take anything the, the people who are very serious about what they do do not take anything for granted um, and they are so particular about how they do it and this is actually a perfect example of why uh, raga room is uh, is is like a platform where when people see it, they they know that this is what it takes these are the behind the scenes stories and this is the beauty of the hard work and when you actually see someone in a performance or a concert the number of uh, uh, repetitions it has taken or the practice that it has taken to get there you know that's uh, such such lovely and heartwarming stories and i really thank you so much for sharing these here with me um and i also have to ask with so many things going on with you both uh, what is the vision that you have for your music and for sapa in the future i think having a, a single vision for the future is is a very hard thing um, um i look at sapa and i hope that we continue to reach children and and people who want to engage with music uh and i hope that over a period of time we'll be able to touch everybody's life in some way uh with music and as an artist and a performer myself i hope that i can continue to create music that's meaningful to me and meaningful to everybody else and overall i think that just as long as i'm moving forward a little bit every day the the overall big picture direction will come yeah i think for me personally uh, i used to be somebody who would have uh, very long term goals but i think post pandemic uh, long term is probably 3 months <laughs> <laughs> true as uh, as an artist uh, i mean as as an artist for me i think um i want to be ready for whatever opportunities present itself and be open uh so i think mo- it's more about kind of trying to improve your skills all the time and uh, i want to be a better violinist better composer every day and then uh, hopefully when uh, when interesting projects when different things happen then i'll be able to do uh, better and better Uh, from my side so i i think as an artist that's that's what i hope for you know this is such a humbling experience for me to see stalwarts like this you know talk so uh, you're so grounded and very very real things very practical things and it has been so wonderful talking to you both and i can't thank you enough for coming to the raga room and sharing all your beautiful experiences and your music here with uh with me and the audience and i really appreciate it thank you so very much again and all the very best for all your projects in future thank you so much thanks thanks, thanks so a lot for having, having us this was a lot of fun thanks loka samasta sukhi lo bhavantu loka samasta sukhi lo bhavantu Dear friends, we hope you enjoyed watching this episode just as much as we did bringing it to you. We thank you so much for being here with us today and look forward to seeing you in all our upcoming episodes of the Raga Room. For more information, visit our website www.theragaroom.com. Thank you so very much and have a wonderful day. Uh-huh.